Beginning today and continuing through Wednesday, you'll hear about a prophecy regarding the last Roman Catholic Pope. Brother Noah Hutchings welcomes co-authors of a new book entitled Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here, to the program. They are Dr. Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. You've heard Brother Tom on past broadcast. He's a prolific author, a book publisher, and former pastor. Brother Chris is a respected theologian and apologist. Here's Brother Hutchings and his guest, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. Thank you, Brother Jerry. Gentlemen, it's good to have you with us today, Dr. Horn. Well, always a pleasure, of course, Noah, to be on with you on the Southwest Radio Ministries. And what a pleasure to also get to be with my good friend, Chris Putnam. Brother Chris, I see now where are you from? And I know you did tremendous work on this book and other books also. Well, thank you very much, Noah. Um, it's an honor to be here. I, I flew in from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a pleasure to be here in Oklahoma with you. Thank you very much. Now, this book that you and uh, Dr. Horn have written, you didn't have any trouble with research, did you? Uh, not at all. Actually, I I probably had three or four more chapters that I could have written that I had on my outline. And there's just so much material when you're dealing with the subject like the Catholic Church, because you have over 2000 years of history to handle. And, you know, we actually had to call it and, you know, stop writing chapters because some of the things that we uncovered in this book are so explosive and they're so keyed on the time that we're in right now that we had to get this book out in print before the events actually occur. My, my. On the program today, we're going to be uh, discussing from your book, you and Dr. Horn, Prophecies of the Pope and the Year 2012. Which one of you gentlemen want to start on this? My, what a tremendous subject. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to just jump right in here and get us going, Noah. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about this is that I didn't imagine a year ago that I would be writing a book on this subject. As you know, I wrote the book Apollyon Rising 2012. You and I did a bunch of shows on that. You carry it and offer it here through the Southwest Radio Ministries. There was only one paragraph in that book that dealt with this subject, the prophecy of the popes. It's a famous prophecy. People can go to Wikipedia, and they can look it up over there and read all about it. But I had only made just one paragraph reference to it in Apollyon Rising. Then what happened was I was speaking at a conference in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and I had my staff with me. And uh, we got to talking about how amazing it was that you have a 900-year-old medieval prophecy and whether you believe in the prophecy or not, whether you think it was inspired or not, regardless of what you think about it, the very next pope on that list is the pope following Benedict the Sixteenth, And according to the prophecy, this is the final pope. And not only is he the final pope, he will become the false prophet of biblical fame and will help give rise to the Antichrist. So imagine just the, the historical fact, the historical quality of having a 900-year-old medieval prophecy that's coming to pass literally before our eyes because everywhere you look right now, if you watch Pope Benedict, he's still the Pope, but he's being wheeled around on a cart. He's feeble. He's a theologian for the church, and he's made the argument that it would be okay under their laws for him to step down if he gets to the point where he can no longer function, carry out his duties as the Pope. His brother is a priest, and his brother is advocating for him to consider stepping down and letting somebody else in the year 2012 take his place. And what's even more important is that the official news media of the Vatican, the El Observatore Romano, which is their official newspaper, has carried several articles in the last few months stating that the Pope might step down in 2012. And actually, they've said that the College of Cardinals is preparing right now for the conclave that will elect the successor to Pope Benedict. So we got to talking about that, and here was the irony. Here I am, I'm in Idaho, I'm speaking at a conference, I'm talking to my staff, and I'm saying, isn't it amazing that nobody has written a book on the fact that this 900-year-old prophecy is about to elapse in the year 2012, and there's so many other occult societies down through time that also pointed to the year 2012. Well, I had just had that conversation, and I went back to my hotel room, and I had an email from Chris Putnam, of all people, 
wanting to know if he could use that one paragraph from my book, Apollyon Rising 2012, on the prophecy of the popes. So anyway, long story short, we got to corresponding back and forth, and we both agreed that nobody else had written the book. Somebody needed to write it. We decided to, but Noah, that is literally just the beginning of the story, because what happened next and the stuff that started falling into our laps, I will tell you, I, I believe this is the most important research I've done in my lifetime. And there were times where both of us stopped in our tracks and wondered if we even should write this book because the hair was standing up on the back of our neck. Well, yes, it's tremendously amazing. Uh, going back to Malachi, who uh, made the prophecy. Now, Malachi, as I understand it, Chris, made this prophecy. When did Malachi live? About 1100? As the, the legend goes, St. Malachi, he's an Irish saint, was summoned to Rome in the year 1139 to appear before the Pope, and he had a vision of all the popes till the end of time. And that was 112 popes. And, and his vision, what, the way it came out, was these little short Latin phrases, you know, like uh, Roman cross or flower of flowers. Some of them are really vague, you know, so it's, it's hard to nail some of them down. But what we found is that there are some compelling fulfillments to this prophecy that it made us take it seriously. You know, when I first started looking at it, I tried to debunk it because I, I didn't know if I should take it seriously or not. But the first thing that caught my attention is that it seems to intersect with biblical prophecy. And I'll just read you the, the, the last prophecy for the very next pope. This is the final pope, Petrus Romanus. Here's the English translation of, of his prediction. And it's the longest one, but it's the most interesting one. It says, in the extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will nourish the sheep in many tribulations. When they are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people, the end. Now, that sounds a lot like the book of Revelation to me. When I see the city of seven hills being destroyed, that reminds me of Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, where it talks about the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And, of course, the woman being Mystery Babylon the Great, and which a lot of commentators throughout history have associated with Rome. If you look in, in Revelation chapter 13, it talks about the false prophet having horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Now, when you, you see that imagery of a lamb, you think that this could be a Christian leader, perhaps, who's, who's actually doing the work of Satan. And so you get the idea that it very well could be a pope. And that, that seems to intersect very nicely with this final prediction and this Malachi prophecy. So then, you know, the challenge is, are there any good reasons to believe that this Malachi prophecy might actually come to pass? And the more I looked into it, the more I found that there are some very compelling fulfillments that, that maybe we should take it seriously. Yes. Dr. Horn, you uh, mentioned the present pope is uh, not in good health, Pope Benedict. He hasn't been pope for very long, has he? No, seven years. Uh, he was elected in 2005. But I uh, also believe you brought out that the average tenure of a pope is 11 years. Yeah, now that's another interesting part of this book. That's one of the things that fell into our lap, Noah, that we weren't expecting. And actually this research, I'll kind of set it up, but Chris could go more into depth if you wanted him to because it was what fell into his bailiwick. He was the one that made the discovery. In fact, during the time we were writing this book, I started referring to him as a bloodhound. Uh, because I thought I was a great researcher until I got involved with Chris and he started digging up things I'd never seen before that we'll talk about during some of these shows. But one of the things that he discovered, and actually I think it's probably the standout portion of this book, was we wanted to know what Catholics thought. So here you have this ancient prophecy, but did the Catholics buy into it? Did they believe it? It was hidden in the archives of the Vatican for 500 years. And there's evidence that the College of Cardinals put uh, credence in it. At least some of them did. So Chris started doing research. He came across a very obscure book that had been written in French by a, a Catholic uh, Irish bishop, or excuse me, a French bishop by the name of René Thibault. Now, this guy was no Johnny-come-lately. 
He was an anagram breaker. He was a code breaker. He was a mathematician. He was an academic. He taught at university. But he wrote this book in 1951, so long before any fascination with the year 2012. But lo and behold, when he was analyzing the prophecy of the Pope from numerous angles, he determined, first of all, that the prophecy is a real prophecy. Now, he's a Jesuit, and he believed it was a true prophecy, and that from the time it was published for public review in 1959, when it became public, and we can talk about that too, that from that time and forward, the average lifespan of a pope had been 11.1 years. So he simply extrapolated from 1959 forward to discover 11 years, and then from his day, 1951 and forward, said, if this holds true, the final pope will arrive in the year 2012. And he discovered this, of course, long before there was any fascination about the Mayan calendar or the year 2012. He also approached this from numerous other very complicated mathematical angles to find from different very improbable possibilities that all pointed to the year 2012 when the final pope, the false prophet, would appear. So the present Pope, Pope Benedict, is not in good health, as I understand. And it's a possibility, uh, at least, that he could resign or this year. Yeah, in fact, as I said a moment ago, he's a theologian. And he has made the argument in his own book that it would be appropriate, actually, under Catholic dogma for the Pope, who really should serve until he dies, but if he gets to the point where he's no longer capable of carrying out his duties, that he should step aside. He would have a responsibility to do that, to allow somebody to be elected into his seat that could then uh, continue to lead, you know, with uh, competence, the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. should also point out that he's not the first one that's made that argument. In the history of Catholicism over hundreds of years, a couple of different times, this issue has been raised, and in fact, one time was even writ to become uh, Vatican law, but it was not uh, signed by, the, by uh, the Pope at that time. So this is an issue that has come around a few times, and many believe that uh, he may, uh, well, of course, he could just die of natural causes in 2012. He could step down and let somebody be elected into his position. And then there's one other fascinating possibility that we talk about in this book. He could be assassinated. And you know, there was a, there was a Catholic bishop on a business trip in China last year who shared what he thought was in confidence with some of his business partners. This is a cardinal by the name of Romeo. And he said, allegedly he said, that Pope Benedict will not live out the year 2012. Well, it was perceived as a threat. Like, oh, like a mafioso plan, right, to take him out. And it was believed so much that the Vatican actually investigated it and created a report around it. Well, it's very uh, interesting uh, that the prophecies of Malachi pointed to uh, Pope Benedict as being the next to the last pope. Now, I, I read all the prophecy of Malachi about all the popes, and it's very interesting that the uh, next pope could be the Antichrist, or at least maybe the false prophet. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I, th I would think the false prophet. He's kind of the forgotten character in biblical prophecy, but you see that in Re Revelation chapter 13, that there are two characters, and, you know, it says that, that, that the, he has... He comes up out of the earth, he had horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast and causes the earth and them that dwell there and to worship the first beast. So this, it's this spiritual leadership that points the world toward worshiping the, the Antichrist. And, you know, who better to do that than someone like a Pope character that already has pretty much universal recognition around the world. So it seems to fit. You know, and, you know, I would pick up where I left off before, and just for your listeners that maybe aren't familiar with this Malachi prophecy, you know, I was saying that there's some good reasons we might, you know, think to take it seriously. And one of the ones that stood out to me when I was first started researching this prophecy was Benedict the Fifteenth. Now, this was the Benedict before the one that's in office now, and he was the Pope from 1914 to 1922. Okay, and the little Latin phrase that matched up to his pontificate for his reign is religio de populata in Latin, and that just means religion depopulated. Okay, now 
What makes that one particularly interesting is that is like a, a very risky prediction. It's not something like flower of flowers or a Roman cross. It's not vague. It says religion will be depopulated. So, you know, if the Roman Catholic Church had grown or if it even stayed the same, then, then that prophecy would have been false. And, you know, and this, this wouldn't be a true prophecy. But what happened during that period of time, 1914 to 1922, we have World War I, which was devastating to the Catholic Church. They lost a lot of people to that. But then even worse, you have the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. You have 200 million people leave the, the Orthodox Church to go into uh, communism. And then you have Stalin and Lenin who declared war on, on faith. And, and, you know, they were persecuting Christian leaders and throwing them in the gulags. Stalin alone is probably responsible for killing 43 million people. So right during the time of, the, of this prediction, religion depopulated, you see the most massive casualties ever in history on the Catholic faith there. And uh, so that prophecy, the way that one hit, really astounded me. And I knew that I couldn't just sweep this thing aside. I had to take it seriously and uh, take a hard look at it. And so that's where I started digging in. And I found these other books, like Tom mentioned, with Rene Thibault. And it does seem to point to the year 2012. As we look at the Catholic Church uh, today in Europe, um, the standing of the Catholic Church in Europe of course, under the European Union, their authority may have been diffused, but I've noticed in the uh, news accounts lately that European Union nations are trying to uh, get rid of England because England is a problem to them and go back to the old setup of the uh, divine right of kings under the Catholic Church. So we could see a reinstitution of the Catholic hierarchy in Europe. And that would fit into the prophecy of 2012. Yeah, actually, Noah, in, in more ways than one, in the sense that when Catholic experts and Catholic seers have looked at the final line in the prophecy of St. Malachi, what they believe is implied by his very name, Petrus Romanus, or Peter the Roman, is that this is going to be a pope who is going to reemphasize the authority of the Roman Catholic Church over all other faiths. And when you think about one of the things you and Chris both said earlier about the Vatican itself, I mean, it, it makes sense that if a false prophet was to appear and have the, uh, the capacity, the international ability to be able to influence the bulk of the world's religious communities to accept the Antichrist, at least for a time, as their, either their political or otherwise their savior, I mean, there's no other organization on earth, religious organization, like the Vatican. It's got diplomatic relationships with 120 countries. It's got 90-some ambassadors that are parked there, you know, on the Seven Hills. It's known for conveying not just religious information, but stuff that the CIA sometimes is dealing with, above top secret information that's being cached from different communities through the Vatican to these other sources that are taking this information back, often because they can't trust the United nations, right? So they're doing this through the Vatican. I mean, there's never been a religious organization structured to be what you could think of as a perfect marriage for the coming of the Antichrist that would also be joined at the hip with the whole political international world. And one thing I would want to say real quick here, I know I should make this clear. I'm not a date setter. You're not a date setter. Other people set these dates, and we're talking about the dates that they set. Uh, furthermore, we didn't want this book to be thought of as being anti-Catholic. It wasn't written to just be an attack on Catholicism. In fact, what's interesting is so many of the sources in this book are actually the Catholics themselves. And the average modern Catholic today, one thing we're finding, is they're not even familiar with what their, what their earliest scholars, their earliest theologians, like Cardinal Henry Manning and others, forecast that at the end of time that it would be the Vatican City, that it would be Rome, and that it wasn't an allegory, it would be the literal physical city of Rome would help give rise to the Antichrist. These were Catholic prophets, and that's what they wrote, and that's what they believed. Your book is not an attack on Catholic Church. No. It's uh, just bringing out uh, facts, just like uh, Protestantism now has its problems. It is split into uh, 
many divisions, and we have some questions about some of the prominent leaders within the non-Catholic various segments of Protestantism and the evangelicalism. Chris, the uh, year 2012, what do we still have about six months to see this prophecy fulfilled? But it's uh, certainly interesting that we have this. Now, along with this book, Dr. Horn, we're also including, uh, what is it, a DVD that you provide or CD? There's so much information on it that it is a data DVD. It required a DVD disc in order to be able to put all this information onto one disc. But it's a disc that they can open on their computer. And it's got literally dozens of books in PDF format. It's got books that are, they can read with their Kindle and their iPad reading devices. It's got over eight hours of other radio shows on the subject matter. It's got movies. It's just a huge DVD library. And by the way, some of the stuff we'll be talking about this week in these various shows on the subject matter, including the French Codex by Rene Thibault, that book, both in French and in English, is on that disc because we want people to know we didn't make this stuff up. It, it's really real. A lot of documents that were written by Catholic experts in the past that, who were predicting uh, this moment. There's huge libraries on here. The works of Josephus, the works of Jonathan Edwards, who we'll talk about probably later this week. It's over 20,000 pages of research material, libraries that we used in the, the writing of this book, it's worth hundreds of dollars. Yes, and uh, also I'm going to include a CD of two programs I did with Malachi Martin in 1992 concerning the New World Order. Those programs are just as relevant today as they were in 1992 because Malachi Martin had tremendous insight as to what is coming down the pike. This really is a priceless item. Chris, yesterday we were discussing the prophecies of Malachi, which indicate the present pope is next to the last pope before uh, Peter of Rome, who will be the last pope, appears. And in his administration, the city of Seven Hills will be destroyed, which corresponds with the prophecies of Revelation. But the prophecies of Malachi, uh, there's some indication they may have been adjusted some in 15 and 90 or thereabout. But how does this affect the overall scope of this particular prophecy that Pope Benedict is uh, next to the last pope? Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me back, Noah. Yeah, you know, if you go and you, and you do any reading about the St. Malachi prophecy of the Pope, you're going to encounter some arguments that the prophecy is a forgery. And, and there's been quite a few of the Jesuits who, who wrote that they don't think that St. Malachi actually wrote it and that it, it was actually some kind of propaganda to get a particular candidate elected Pope around 1590. And, you know, when I... When I was investigating the prophecy, when we started doing the research for the book, I, I read several books by these Jesuits who, who call it a forgery. And, you know, some of their arguments, I believe, are correct. And um, you can see some evidence that the earlier portions of the prophecy, probably before 1570 or so, actually match a certain book, which was written by a fellow named Panvinius. He had written a papal history in that time and it appears that someone copied his book and made the prophecy match that book and and the reason why i can detect that is that there are anti-popes and an anti-pope is basically when there was a controversy or a schism in the church there would actually be two popes at the same time one in rome and one would set up an alternate papacy and you know the the malachi prophecy actually handles several anti-popes but it doesn't handle all of them. It actually skips a couple that, were, that had happened during the, the earlier portion of the prophecy. And the thing that's interesting is that the prophecy follows the same antipopes as this guy Panvinius's book to the T. So that's a little suspicious. And it, and it kind of tells us that someone did go back and manipulate this document and make it match that book perfectly. 
And, and what the scholars have studied this think is that they were trying to get a certain candidate, probably a guy named Simon Selly, elected pope, because the motto was the old city, and he is actually from an area that had the name Old City in Latin, so it would match him perfectly. So I think that there is some merit to the argument that someone manipulated this prophecy. But what that does not explain is the fact that the prophecy continued all the way up to 112 pups way past this time when, when this um, conspiracy allegedly happened. It just doesn't make any sense to me that a Catholic would create this document and extrapolate it so far into the future and even predict the destruction of Rome. You know, when someone makes a claim or, or a prediction that is against their best interest, something that's not convenient to their point of view, then it's usually true. You know, and for a Catholic source to predict the destruction of Rome is kind of it kind of contradicts their theology and their eschatology and i mean the catholic eschatology usually entails that the catholic church conquers the world and then jesus comes back i mean they they see themselves as as the victory so a prophecy that that you know prophesies their their demise and their judgment um seems to contradict their what they would want to be true so that tells me that it's probably, you know, likely that somebody didn't just manufacture that as propaganda. It wouldn't be in their interest to do so. And it also doesn't explain the fact that we see fulfillments of these little Latin mottos so far into the future. And like the one that we talked about yesterday was Benedict the Fifteenth with religion depopulated and how that was the time the church actually lost the most people. And that was well after the, the copy that we have in print. We have a copy of this prophecy in print from 1595. So, you know, we're talking about the predictions that have gotten more accurate even now into the modern time. Um, John Paul II, the Pope that probably everybody remembers because he was so popular, uh, his little Latin phrase meant, from the labor of the sun. Some people would translate that the eclipse of the sun or pregnancy of the sun, or travails of the sun. Um, but what's interesting about that is he, John Paul was born during a partial solar eclipse, and then he was also buried during a partial solar eclipse. So you can literally match up this prophecy from the labor of the sun to his life in a very obvious way. The Pope before him, John Paul I, who's famous for one of the shortest papacies in history, his was from the midst of the moon, and uh, he was actually ascended to the papacy on the precise day of a half moon. So it, the midst of the moon corresponds exactly to the, the, the history that happened with him. So there's some very compelling, almost supernatural fulfillments that seem to um, preclude the fact that this document was simply a forgery because it just doesn't explain the modern fulfillments that seem to be supernatural. Yes, and as we mentioned yesterday, prophecy indicates this present pope will resign or something happen to him before the end of 2012. And the new pope will be the last pope. That's the title of the book, Peter of Rome. He will be the last pope according to the prophecy. Brother Tom, I notice in this book you uh, reference Malachi Martin quite a bit. I know Malachi Martin. You reference uh, one of the books he wrote, The Keys of This Blood, quite a bit. I did programs with him uh, quite often. He had, by that time, of course, not become a Catholic any longer. He, The Pope had given him permission to renounce his vows to the church. But could you tell me a little bit about why you reference Malachi Martin so much and what connection it has with the book? Yeah, well, of course, because Malachi Martin was a very well-respected priest. Only towards the end of his life, when he was saying things about Rome that other Catholics might not have wanted him to say, did anybody take issue with who he was. He was a formidable polyglot. He spoke several languages. He uh, worked for the Vatican in interpreting the Dead Sea Scrolls. He taught at the academic level. 
in Rome. He was the personal go-to man for three different popes. So here was a guy that was eminently qualified to do what he did, to say what he said, but he became a maverick. Now, you know, you could go into all the reasons about maybe why he did. Uh, Maybe he was more interested in truth than he was in dogma. I don't know, but he certainly spent the latter part of his life being willing to talk about how Rome was being set up by internal false priests. Now, people have pointed to this ancient document called the Alta Vendita, which uh, was uh, essentially a Freemasonic document that had spelled out a plan about how Rome would be infiltrated by false Catholics who would come in, but ultimately their goal was to use the Vatican as a platform for help us to help establish the New World Order. And that's uh, much of his book, The Keys of This Blood, Windswept House. He, he called it faction, which meant it was fiction based on fact. I think some of the shows you did with him, I think you were talking about one of those books. But, but he was very outspoken. He was a critic of uh, policy inside the church following Vatican II. He thought there was heresy. In fact, he flat said that Rome had become apostate. Well, why would we include him in a book on prophecy? Because so many of these earlier Catholic prophecies said that that's exactly what was going to happen, that Rome would become apostate. Henry Cardinal Manning, who was one of the bishops, uh, Salvador Zola, Frederick William Hill, these were all early, very well respected, still are respected, by the way, Catholic academics. And guess what they said? They said that in the last days, Rome will become apostate, a false pope under the control of Satan. The false prophet of biblical fame will help, uh, will assist in giving rise to this political figure that we call the Antichrist. And of course, Malachi Martin uh, was very, very outspoken on that. He alleged that there was an enthronement of the archangel Lucifer. In Rome, one of the purposes behind that enthronement, though, if you read his book, Windswept House, was to instill within a future pope the inception of that false spirit that would become the false prophet. Part of the Satanism that was going on behind the Leonine walls of the Holy See uh, was because there were Satanists. Now, how, what an incredible thought. And if it wasn't coming from an eminent Jesuit theologian like Malachi Martin, it would have been easy to dismiss this as just an attack on Rome. Uh, Martin didn't have anything to gain. He had everything to lose. Uh, not just his credibility, but his friendship and connections with all those people that he had been involved with in Rome. And it really cost him a lot. He became a maverick. He was considered a renegade, an outcast, whatever. So what, what was motivating him to do it? I don't know. But I'll tell you this. He wrote a lot. Nobody's ever disproved what he said. In fact, other priests came along. You might remember um, how in uh, uh, 1999, there was a book written by uh, Monsignor Luigi Marinelli, and uh, the book was called Gone with the Wind in the Vatican, and it sold 100,000 copies in one week, and it talked expressly about Satanism being conducted inside the Vatican for the express purpose of making sure this Luciferian scheme to use Rome for a new world order uh, would be unfold. You might also remember in, in at Fatima 2000, at the International Fatima celebration there, the Conference for World Peace, uh, Archbishop Emmanuel Malongo uh, alleged that high-placed uh, Catholics among the top hierarchy in Rome were in league with Satan. And when the Fatima Crusader, a magazine, asked Malachi Martin if that was true, here's what uh, Malachi Martin answered, quote, Anybody who's acquainted with the state of affairs in the Vatican in the last 35 years is well aware that the Prince of Darkness has had and continues to have his surrogates in the court of St. Peter in Rome, end quote. So, um, so this is coming from highly placed, completely qualified, high-level uh, cardinals who are telling us this is happening in Rome then, but but toward a specific purpose. There was a plan behind it. And it was basically to use the Vatican City, the, the government of Rome, uh, as a platform on which the Antichrist would be able to acquire the allegiance of the world's religious communities.
Yes, I communicated with uh, Malachi Martin uh, quite often because in the Vatican, uh, he was in charge of uh, intelligence, really. If I wanted to know anything happening in the world, I would call Malachi Martin. And in 1992, uh, I recorded uh, two programs with him on uh, the coming New World Order. They were very enlightening programs, and uh, they're even more relevant today, I think, than when he did the program with me 20 years ago. These uh, recordings, really, uh, with Maliki Martin, are actually priceless, and uh, we're including them on a CD both programs, along with the book. So if you get the book, you will hear Malachi Martin explaining about the coming New World Order. And uh, Brother Tom has quoted Malachi Martin quite frequently in the book to uh, document what is happening in the Vatican and uh, what is may happen in the future. Brother Chris, one chapter uh, in your book, I believe it's, Chapter 3, about the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now, I believe your thoughts on that is that the Pope will be the false prophet. Uh, will there be a, a Pope who will be the Antichrist? Well, yeah, our thought is that the Pope is the false prophet. And, and we base that on, on Revelation chapter 13, where it, it talks about two beasts. And, and it seems to, to me that when I read that chapter that one is a world political figure and the other is a spiritual leader who points toward him. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, who is a better candidate than a pope? You know, like Tom said yesterday, that, you know, you already have this huge, you know, political machinery in the Vatican and, and in Catholicism established worldwide. So, you know, when you read the prophecy, in Revelation chapter 13, and it talks about that the second beast had horns like a lamb. You know, like a lamb sounds like a Christian symbol, but he speaks like a dragon. And, and he exercises the power of the first beast, who would be the Antichrist, and calls of all the earth to worship him. So, you know, I think that that's the character that we're probably looking at with this um, false prophet in, in, in the Malachi prophecy with Petrus Romanus, the final pope. Yes, we look at what is happening in Europe today and the popes and uh, the present pope who may uh, resign before the end of the year. Certainly, uh, this, this is interesting. Brother Tom, do you have any comment on the prophecy of the pope and the Antichrist and the false prophet? Yeah, well, certainly. And, you know, one thing I would want to uh, clarify for my reputation and maybe yours, too, although I don't think you concern yourself too much about uh, what does it say on the back of one of your books? I'm I'm 80 some years old and I can say whatever I want to say. <laughs> I'm something like that. Uh, but uh, I, well, but one thing I would want to make clear is that it was a concern to me and Chris, too. And that is we are uh, conservative evangelicals. Uh, we don't uh, hold on a par with the authority of the scripture, any extra biblical prophecies. And so we go at length, especially early on in this book, to qualify why would we even pay attention to a prophecy that is extra biblical. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why we did that. One, of course, because this is a historical moment. This is an ancient medieval prophecy. It is concluding with the successor of Benedict the 16th who looks like uh, that prophecy uh, that prophecy looks like it could be fulfilled at any moment so in that sense it makes it historic and i have to admit that we used it as an excuse for a larger study into biblical prophecy and the arrival of the false prophet and the antichrist now having said that there is a really important point that chris putnam made in our book, Petrus Romanus, the final pope is here, and that is that God has, at times in history, used unexpected sources to make prophecy. For instance, one of the examples Chris gives is Nebuchadnezzar. So here you have a guy that is a, an evil, narcissistic, pagan king, 
And God chooses to give one of the most important prophecies in history. He gives him this prophecy of the metallic idol, the head of gold, the silver arms and uh, a brass, the brass belly, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay. And who does he choose to give that to but a pagan? And then not only gives it to a pagan, but requires his holy servant Daniel to even provide the interpretation. And this is one of the most central especially for dispensationalists, is one of the most central prophecies ever given to mankind. And God gave it through somebody that we totally would not have expected. Uh, here's an even better one, and that's Balaam. So here you got an evil sorcerer, right? A sorcerer by the name of Balaam, uh, a Moabite king by the name of Balak, who is afraid of the Israelites, uh, and he hires this sorcerer by the name of Balaam to prophesy against uh, Israel. Uh, and yet, look at what uh, Balaam prophesied in the book of Numbers twenty four seventeen, when he says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. This is one of the most... Scholars recognize this as probably the prophecy that caused the Magi to travel uh, to uh, Jerusalem to try to find the unborn uh, king in Jesus Christ. So one of the most central prophecies ever given, and it's given by who? A, the, the <laughs> sorcerer that's going to live in infamy. So... When you look at the prophecy of the popes and you consider how accurate and even more so accurate it has become over time, you have to ask yourself this key question then. Was it divinely inspired? Was it demonically inspired? And then there's a third option, and that is, is this thing that was hidden away in the archives of the Vatican for 500 years, does it happen to mean something to the cardinals so that they would only elect a pope if he happens to one way or another match up with the prophecy. And if that's the case, you have to ask yourself, why are they doing that? Why would they choose popes only if they could align somehow with this prophecy? But one way or the other, what Rene Thibault, and he was a Jesuit academic, he determined it was a real prophecy. So not all of the Jesuits had issues with this prophecy. And he also saw in it that it predicted the arrival of this man in the year 2012, and he considered it to be uh, truly a prophecy. And then finally, of course, concludes in his book, in 2012, we will find out if the seer saw correctly. We have been bringing out, according to an ancient prophecy of Malachi, back in, I think, Chris, about 1100? 1139. 1139. There would be so many popes, and he named all the popes, or he gave some identification feature about the popes that were to be from his time. Of course, in about 1500, there was some slight adjustment, but still did not interfere with the remaining popes from that time. And according to the lineage of popes, there will be one more pope, Peter the Roman. Chris, in the scenario, prophetic scenario, in the uh, days of Peter the Roman, Rome will be destroyed. That would indicate that Rome may be Babylon, right? I think so. I mean, if you look at the prophecies in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, it, it says that mystery Babylon is that great city which sit over the kings of the earth at the end of Revelation 17. And at the time that John wrote that book, then Rome was certainly the city. And as I have brought out, Europe is trying to restore the old divine right of kings where the king uh, was anointed by the pope. And if you rebelled against the Catholic religion, then the king would go out and burn you at the stake. And uh, along come the uh, Protestant Reformation, and uh, many of the reformers went to Geneva. And then that resulted in the uh, 1559 Geneva Bible. Now, the dates, 2012, 2016, are rather prominent in the uh, prophetic scenario concerning the end of the uh, papal line. Is that right? That, that's right, Dr. Hutchings. One of the things that I did in, in researching this book was you know, try to examine how this prophecy of the popes and the papal system fits into biblical prophecy, because you know, my main interest is, is the Bible and, and God's Word, and that, those are the, the real prophecies that I've always been the most interested in. So. 
you know, this prophecy of the Pope's thing, you know, it, it's only valuable to me in as, you know, in the way that it coincides with biblical prophecy, which I know is the word of God. And, you know, I was in seminary and when you're in seminary, they require you to take a year of church history where, where you examine from the dawn of the church up until the modern period. And, you know, I had to do some research papers and I decided I wanted to research how, you know, great Christian thinkers have interpreted the book of Revelation and the prophecies of Daniel throughout history. And I started looking at how you know, Martin Luther and, and the Reformers interpreted these prophecies. And without exception, from the time, even before Luther, but from the time of Luther up until the 20th century, nearly all Protestant interpreters saw the Pope as the Antichrist and the Roman Church as the Antichrist system. And um, the way that they, they read Revelation 12, you know, if your listeners will recall, in Revelation 12, there's a woman clothed with the sun, and they, they saw that as the church, and they saw that the red dragon chased the woman out into the desert for a period of 1260 days. Now, the way the Reformers interpreted that was that they used the year-to-day formula. Now that you know, based on like the seventy-week prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter nine, that that a day equals a year. So what they did is they thought that the reign of the papal antichrist system began somewhere between six oh six, when the Pope declared himself to be the universal bishop over the church. Now many of them believed it was that date, and and then others they also allowed for a second date which was around between the time of 752 A.D. to 756 A.D., and that was the time when the Pope became a political power. Now, what happened during that time? And that's the date that, that I argue for in our book, Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here. Now, what happened in that time, right in the 750s A.D., is Pope Stephen used a fraudulent document. It was a document that they just concocted out of whole cloth. It was called the Donation of Constantine, and it, it's completely made up. And what they did is they said that the Emperor Constantine had donated all the land to the Roman Church that had belonged to the Roman Empire. When when Constantine moved his headquarters into um, to Constantinople, he abandoned the city of Rome, but he the, the, the Roman Church invented this document. It was completely fraudulent. It's been proven to be fraudulent. Pope Stephen took that to the reigning king of the empire at the time, which was Pepin. He was Charlemagne's father. And he used this, this fraudulent document to say, will you take your army and come clear away all these people around Rome and give that power to me? And Pepin did that. He went and he, he slaughtered the Lombards and some of the other tribes that were living around Italy at the time and gave all that land and all that power to the Pope. So the Pope ascended to temporal political power by fraud, okay, and he took over this entity, you know, and Jesus had said that his kingdom was not of this world, and when the devil tempted Jesus with all the kingdoms of the earth, you know, Jesus turned that offer down, and, you know, I think the church really took a bad turn when, when they lied to take political power. You know, they, they left the spiritual realm and went into the realm of the world. And so right at this time in 752, 756, you see a turn. You see the, the Catholic Church go into the Dark Ages. And uh, historians even call this period of time the pornocracy because there was so much immorality in the church. You had popes that were just doing horrible things. Could that have been part of the Dark Ages? Absolutely. That was, that's the, the, the time of the Dark Ages. Now, you give a date of uh, 1260 and uh, 752. Now, you add those together, you come up with 2012, that's, right? That's correct. So that the, the Reformers and the, the people that believe that the book of Revelation described church history from the ascension up until the second coming, that's how they interpret it. So they saw that 1260 days in Revelation 12 is 1260 years, and they added that to the time that the papacy achieved this power, either 752, so 1260 plus 752 is 2012. 
You know, if it's, you add it to, to 756, it's 2016, which kind of interestingly is a three and a half year period, which we think is, you know, the great tribulation time. So the, I, there's actually room, you know, in there, in there. So, you know, if you look at what Charles Spurgeon or Jonathan Edwards or even John Wesley, John Calvin, they all interpreted the book of Revelation this way, and it would have the ending date of the papal system and, and, you know, the Great Tribulation beginning right now in, the, in this year or, or by 2016. Very interesting. Now, you mentioned, I believe, uh, Jonathan Edwards in your book. Jonathan Edwards was a uh, preacher. That I, I don't think uh, anyone ever surpassed Jonathan Edwards as far as a sermon delivery. It was said of him that when he preached on hell, Grown men cried, and the ladies fainted. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of amazing to to look at to study Jonathan Edwards. He he was one of the lead pastors of what is known as the Great Awakening, where you just had mass conversions to the gospel. I mean, people accepting Christ in America in an unprecedented rate. And the thing that I learned in seminary that it's really astounding about. That is, you know, you mentioned that response with with women fainting and grown men crying. But from what I've read about the accounts of the way he preached, he actually just stood there and read his sermons from a piece of paper. He wasn't very emotional in his delivery. It was the content of his sermons. It was what he wrote, not really the way he said it. And, you know, you have to believe that it's really just a work of the Holy Spirit of God you know, not so much a credit to a, a particular man, but just that, that God blessed him and he was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, that's why we had this great awakening in America that resulted in, in so many new Christians coming into the church. But uh, his eschatology, what he believed about the book of Revelation was that the papal system was the Antichrist system and, and that it would come to fruition right in this period of time that we have entered now. One thing that concerns me, or I wonder about, there has been a rapid trend toward accepting homosexual behavior as normal, and now then our president comes out and says that homosexual marriages are just as uh, sacred or according to the, of the Bible as marriage between a man and a woman. And, of course, we read as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot. I feel that our president placed the United States under God's judgment when he did that. But I think the encouraging thing is that judgment didn't fall until Lot left. That's true. You know, I, I think we're seeing a, a widespread apostasy from biblical truth. You know, this revelation about President Obama's position on gay marriage is, is really kind of old news to me. Um, I also function as a biblical apologist. And, and, you know, I know that right after Obama was elected, he gave a speech to the Lesbian, Gay, Transgender Association. And, and in that speech, I mean, I can quote it. He said that he dreams of a day when a marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman is looked at exactly the same as a marriage between a man and a woman. He said that back within days of his election. So this is old news. I mean, it He's always had those sentiments. He just didn't admit it publicly until recently. But I mean, the thing that really disturbs me, Noah, the most is that we're seeing some of the mainline denominations in Christianity accept this. And not only are they accepting things like gay marriage, they're accepting gay clergy. Now, we've had two major denominations, the Evangelical Lutherans and, you know, and the, P, the, the PCA, the Presbyterian um, the PCUSA denomination. I don't want to confuse them because there's one of those that did, did not do it. So I think it's PCUSA and the ELCA Lutherans have endorsed gay clergy. Now, this not only means they accept it as an acceptable lifestyle, they're putting up leaders in front of their congregations that are modeling this lifestyle. Now, you know, if you look at the New Testament, you don't have to go to the Old Testament. You can look at a verse like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, that says that they will not enter the kingdom of heaven if they persist in this lifestyle, that they must repent. 
And if you're putting up leaders that are modeling that as a lifestyle in front of your congregations, it seems to me that these, con these, these denominations are, are leading people to hell. Yeah, well, you can go to Romans 1. Absolutely. That's the most severe condemnation of Christianity that uh, there possibly could be. <clears throat> so there's no excuse for it. And uh, I think what amazing uh, also is that pastors are not saying anything about it from the pulpit. That's why it's coming in. The pastors are not saying anything about it. In those denominations, it appears that the pastors are the ones leading the apostasy, which is the thing that is so disturbing. But, you know, I guess we should expect it because, you know, our, our Bible prophecies do predict a massive falling away from biblical truth. They, they predict an apostasy. And I think that's what we are seeing. And, you know, and I thought it was very interesting what you said at the beginning of the show about that issue. You were talking about it's putting us under God's judgment. You know, in that, that passage in Romans 1 that you talked about, um, you know, it talks about how, you know, God is evident from creation, from the things that have been made, that, that everyone knows God, but they deny him. It says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And, and what follows that is the discussion of, of homosexuality. It says, for this reason, God gave them over to do what they should not do. And it almost sounds to me that the homosexual acts are the judgment, that the fact that our nation has drifted away from belief in God and, and drifted away from accepting the inerrancy of Scripture and, and, and the authority of God's Word, that homosexuality is actually the judgment that has fallen upon us. Yes, along this line, and what is uh, also happening or happened in the Catholic Church, you know, regarding pedophilia among the... Uh, priest that's uh, just as bad isn't it? it it's 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 institutionally worse it's not just a sexual thing it appears from the sources that we've uncovered and that we discuss in the book petrus romanus the final pope is here that the pedophilia epidemic in the catholic church is a result of a satanic influence that has infiltrated the vatican to the level where it's not just uh, just a, um, a matter of lust or, or some kind of thing where you have celibate priests that are taking out their, their lust on, on their uh, parishioners. Actually, that this is actually some sort of ritual sex magic that's part of Satanism. And it's not, we didn't make that up. That came from Catholic sources. Malachi Martin talked about that specifically. So, you know, it's not just a conspiracy theory. This, this is what the Catholics are saying. You know, I've been following the scandal. Um, the summer of 2011 in Amsterdam, Holland, the, uh, the newspaper articles broke out where there was 20,000 new reported cases of pedophilia. So, I mean, the level of of the crimes is still being uncovered. I mean, it's been going on for the last 10 years, but there's still new cases coming out, massive amounts of them. Ireland right now ha has thousands and thousands of cases, and it's, it's a huge controversy in Ireland right now. The level of this is still being exposed, and, um, you know, it's, it's an institutional problem. And, and the pope that's in office right now, Pope Benedict XVI, he it was instrumental in covering this up. Uh, he authored a document back when he was Cardinal Ratzinger that basically advocated demonizing the victims and then hiding the priests that were doing the crimes. And, you know, it's one thing to defend yourself, but what they were doing was moving these priests around to, to different areas where they could continue doing it, and at the same time, demonizing the victims. I mean, if they were really repentant and they really wanted to stop it and they, they really cared about the victims of these sex crimes, you know, why are they trying to make them into the bad guys? You know, instead of turning these priests over to law enforcement so they would stop doing what they did, they hit them, they moved them to a different area, and then they tried to make the victims look like it was their fault. To me, that's just unconscionable, and, and it's not the kind of behavior that someone who is trying to emulate Jesus Christ, a Christian should not behave that way. And, uh, of course, the Catholic Church actually originated replacement theology, that God was through, to, was through with Israel, it, there would never be another Israel, and all the promises made to Israel had been inherited by the Church, meaning, of course, 
the uh, Catholic Church. What is the stand of the uh, Catholic Church on Israel today? You know, that that's a good question. The Catholic Church opposed modern Israel since its inception. Back, you know, in, in 1947, uh, when the UN was thinking about developing the charter uh, for the modern state of Israel, the Catholic Church opposed it. They, they did not want it. Um, they have always had designs on Jerusalem for themselves, and that's what the Crusades were all about. And so part of the original uh, documents that the UN wrote up, um, they were trying to make Jerusalem an international city where it had wide jurisdiction and it was not just solely the capital of Israel. And the Catholic Church was, you know, they still bring that up today that Jerusalem is supposed to be an international city and that they want sovereignty over parts of it. And, um, you know, when the, the, the Six Day War occurred and uh, Israel finally got sovereignty over Jerusalem for the first time, the Catholic Church has always opposed that. And you can look at the statements they've made since 1948. They've always opposed national Israel um, as an entity. In fact, they did not even recognize the state of Israel until 1993, okay? So we have this historic event in 1948 where Israel becomes a nation again, you know, and all of us that follow Bible prophecy were celebrating because we see this as, as a fulfillment of, of so many prophecies, you know, from Ezekiel with the dry bones and Isaiah, which says that I will recover you a second time. In Isaiah chapter 11, it talks about God regathering the nation of Israel. And, you know, it says it even says a second time, which, which proves that it could not have been after the Babylonian captivity. So we see this huge fulfillment of biblical prophecy in 1948, and the Catholic Church denies it. I mean, they, they don't believe it, and they have opposed it. You know, they've always opposed Israel, and today we see some jockeying for position, and, you know, they in 1993 they finally recognized the state of Israel, but it's almost as an afterthought because they had to, because they were hoping that it would go away. But most of the mainline uh, Protestant uh, denominations, those that broke off from the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation, they uh, pretty much remain uh, to this position also, don't they? Well, quite a few of them do. Quite a few of them do. Not all of them. But what, what I did find, you know, when I was researching the beliefs of, of some of the great Christian thinkers in the past, it, is there have consistently been scholars and preachers that saw a future for Israel. And some of the more interesting ones were the ones, you know, before it happened. Um, for instance, when I, I, I researched uh, Sir Isaac Newton's prophetic writings, he saw the restoration of Jerusalem. And, and he, I mentioned him in the book Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here. Newton actually thought that perhaps the first little section of the 70 weeks of Daniel predicted the second restoration of Jerusalem, which is what we saw happen in the Six-Day War. Um, so Newton sort of allowed that, that that could happen again, and, and lo and behold, it did. Uh, another one is uh, Charles Spurgeon, who, who's one of the, he's known as the Prince of Preachers, and uh, he predicted the restoration of Israel, and he believed that Israel would come back into the land. But, but Noah, you're correct. Unfortunately, um, Many of our mainline denominations and many scholars today do not think that the nation of Israel is that significant to Bible prophecy. And to me, I just find that astounding because when I read prophecies like the dry bones prophecy in Ezekiel, um, I, you know, God is talking about gathering a broken and beaten down um, nation and, and rebuilding them and the dry bones come back to life. You know, like I said, the, the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, he says, I will regather you a second time. You know, there's too many Old Testament prophecies that, that predicted what we see today. We live in an interesting time, and I certainly would recommend that you get a copy of Peter the Roman. You'll get a tremendous DVD, and also two programs that I did with Malachi Martin in 1992. His last program was particularly interesting to me. What was going to happen to society and our school within the next couple of decades? And what he uh, predicted has exactly happened. 
you'll get the uh, two programs also on uh, CD uh, of Malachi Martin that I did in 1992. But uh, I've encouraged you to get a book, and thank you, Chris, for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thanks to both of you for another interesting program. Brother Hutchings mentioned the programs he did with Catholic priest Malachi Martin in 1992. You'll hear them tomorrow and Friday, so plan right now to be with us. And, of course, if you haven't already contacted us about getting a copy of Petrus Romanus, the 528-page book we've been offering, today is a good time to do that. The book's available in appreciation of a $25 contribution in the U.S., $30 in Canada. Along with the book, you'll also get the computer DVD library collection and the two programs with Malachi Martin on CD at no additional gift amount. To get everything, call 1-800-652-1144. Coming next over most of these stations is a Bible in the News report. Join us tomorrow on your Watchman on the Wall program, a presentation of Southwest Radio Ministries. Welcome to today's Bible in the News Report, a feature of your Watchman on the Wall program of Southwest Radio Ministries. I'm Jerry Giltner. I'll be bringing you today's report. You've heard the song, You Are in the Army Now. Usually when we heard those words, we thought of national pride and protection. Being a defender of the American way of life was honorable. The lyrics might now be, You are in the United Nations Army Now because our soldiers may be forced to wear the U.N. logo, and with that, the pride will go. Perhaps you also recall that way back in the 1990s, a U.S. Army Specialist E-4, Michael G. New, was tossed out of the military because he refused to wear the uniform of the United Nations. The medic got the boot under the Clinton administration, with the then Vice President Al Gore telling widows and orphans of soldiers killed in Iraq, and this is a quote, they died in the service of the United Nations, close quotes. World Net Daily, WND, reported in an Internet story on May 12, 2012, that Phyllis Shafley wrote of that statement back then. This is a quote. That wasn't a slip of the tongue. His words revealed the Clinton administration's plan to use our armed forces as U.N. mercenaries all over the world at the whim of U.N. bureaucrats, close quotes. Shafley said New had, again we quote, raised the flag of patriotism against the Clinton-Gore goal, close quotes. We further quote from WND's story, what if knew was right all along, and the order to don the U.N. emblems was unlawful, as he argued throughout his dispute with his commanding officers and his court-martial and throughout the appeals process. It would mean that prosecutors in the Clinton administration withheld exculpatory evidence, deceived a judge in the case, and misled defense counsel to stamp out what could have been a rebellion against illegal orders to serve under the banner of the international political group. That's the very assertion in a new and unprecedented appeal to the U.S. Army Court of Criminal Appeals in a petition for extraordinary relief in the nature of a writ of error. It's being filed by Herbert W. Titus of counsel with the law firm of William J. Olson, P.C., Titus told WND that an appropriate resolution of the apparent misbehavior by prosecutors probably would include vacating the conviction and removing it from News Record. Shafley's article quoted in New himself to get the message across, I took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. My Army enlistment oath is to the Constitution. I cannot find any reference to the United Nations in that oath. Close quotes. 
A very good case could be made that the U.N. will be a major component of the coalition of the Antichrist during the tribulation, and the military will be part of it. We read, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That's from Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. That's today's Bible in the News Report of Southwest Radio. To get a complimentary copy of the monthly publication, call 800-652-1144. Be here for our next Your Watchman on the Wall program and a Bible in the News Report.